डॉक्टर ये राव देकर एंड डॉक्टर आशीष बैनर्जी जस्ट गॉन आउट ब्रिगेडियर पंडित कर्नल कपूर फैकल्टी ऑफ सिम्बॉइस एंड स्टूडेंट्स सो डॉक्टर राजीव स्टार्टिंग विद यू सर आई डिड कॉन्टम्पलेट अ टाई एंड अ ब्लेजर बिफोर आई लेफ्ट चंडीगढ़ दिस मॉर्निंग एंड आई डिड टेल माई सेल्फ दैट आई थिंक पूना इज अ राधर हॉट पार्ट ऑफ आर कंट्री एंड सो आई स्किप्ड ऑन अ टायर अ लिटल I know you are very particular on time, and I'll try and stick to the one hour that's allotted to me. And all I'll say is that uh, Colonel Kapoor, after you to come on this podium and try and say a few words, is a very tall task and a tall order. And uh, I also want to tell you, sir, that a lot of what you have said is very, very dear to my heart. And emotional quotient, if I look at it, is probably a quality. You know, you have to be a CEO of a company. and then to be a ceo in healthcare one of the things that would uh, be different would be the great need for empathy and emotional question so it is something that distinguishes uh, leadership elsewhere as well as leadership in healthcare another aspect that's very dear to my life and uh, sir touched upon it is the sacrifices made by our defense services and i often tell people that you know the epitome of leadership is leading people into battle not knowing whether you will come back that evening and what we discuss in board rooms about profit profitability and you know whatever else may be pales into insignificance and the kind of leadership that we exhibit doesn't anywhere get close to getting into battle leading people and defending your motherland so with that little prelude i will and the other sad part is i do have a power point and i do hope <laughs> and i do hope that i can make a point with this power point you know i had lunch with sir and i was telling him i said this morning i got a forward which was a write up it spoke about amazon and it said that the ceo of amazon has said that in executive meetings which i think is the senior leadership there will be no power points and everybody has to narrate what he wants to say you copied it from me sorry sir you copied it from me <laughs> from you okay <laughs> and everybody has to say and narrate what he wants to say for the simple reason that emotion is a very important aspect which tends to get lost in a powerpoint now i will try and make the point as well as keep some emotion when i go through this powerpoint of mine okay so is this yeah is good yes. yeah okay so what does it take to be the ceo of a healthcare company so the first a disclaimer that i have is that i am not a ceo i've never been a ceo and i'll come to what a ceo is and how uh, there is a little bit of gray between even heading a hospital you know many one hospital heads are called ceos and so therefore you know chief operating officer is often uh, you know mixed up with the ceo but disclaimer is i've never ever been a ceo in my life second is that you know you would say that it's necessary to be a doctor uh, to be heading a healthcare uh, vertical and in fact uh, dr rajiv even referred to me as dr ashish unless he must have been referring to you my apologies <laughs> now at somewhere i thought maybe he's referring to me but there was a possibility he thought i was a doctor so the next disclaimer is that i am not a doctor so if i am traveling somewhere and somebody will tell me what do you do and i'll say i work for fortis healthcare so he says oh you are a doctor so i said no i'm not a doctor and then the next question is that okay so then you must be an mba so the disclaimer here is that neither am i an mba i am a pure graduate in economics honors and somebody said delhi university no i did my education in ahmedabad my father was in the army and i had been in a boarding school all my life and my dad was very keen that i was you know with him where he was posted when i finished my class 12 so from st xavier's college i did my uh, graduation and which was uh, in economics and i was an outdoor person and i wanted a job as soon as i could get one and i became a tea planter in assam and that is why i cut down my education and so on and so forth because all they required was a graduation and the beauty was i went through my interviews and everything nobody even asked me for my results nobody wanted to see whether i was a graduate or not so till today i mean i haven't really had to pull out my degree anyway to say that yes i have done my graduation so with that said 
uh, I will come very briefly because you know I'll just quickly go through all of this is you know uh, when Dr. Banerjee and I were talking in terms of uh, you know what these what does he want me to speak about so he did say that you know a lot of people think that uh, you know, it's necessary to be a doctor. So should we talk about that? We even spoke about, you know, saying that, you know, should I talk about my journey in, uh, in healthcare? You know, and then finally, we came down to this topic, which was very up there saying, you know, what does it take to be a CEO, but I will try and weave it into a story in terms of what I've done and things like that. So my healthcare experience is now 16 years and a few months. I used to work with Hero Motors. That's a company that was uh, producing a vehicle called a Hero Pook. Uh, it's no longer in production, but many youngsters at that point of time had this 65cc hero poke, which was a peppy two-geared uh, vehicle. It did reasonably well in this part of the country because I was heading sales for both national and international, and I did travel to Pune, and uh, it was you know to meet dealerships and things like that. So from there, I you know move into this healthcare space. Fortis Healthcare in 2001 June sets up its first hospital in Mohali. Uh, and 8.33 acres of land and they put up this wonderful state-of-the-art hospital and I visit that hospital in the month of October on my way to the school called the Lawrence School Sana where I did my education and I love Chandigarh as a city it's in the foothills in 45 minutes to an hour you can be up at 6,000 feet uh, it's a wonderful city for those of you who've been to uh, Chandigarh so I was in Delhi uh, you know commuting working living there and wanted to come back to Chandigarh and sort of came and saw this hospital. So I'll cut a long story short, in the January of 2002, I joined Fortis Healthcare. I was Vice President Marketing in Hero Motors and we had a wonderful uh, Chief People's Officer who told me, he says, now you know, the hospital started in June, all the positions in the hospital have been taken and uh, I have interviewed you and I know that you've got the potential to do well in healthcare. But the question is, what do I take you as? And therefore, I started off as what was a business manager and he very nicely told me business managers manage business, they can be vice presidents, they can be presidents. Now the whole idea was he couldn't give me any designation which was worthwhile. So I settled for what was a business manager. My first job was to look after purchase in that hospital and I tell people my office was in the basement, it had a common wall to the mortuary and the wall used to get damp at times and there are days that I actually almost wept. And I told myself, where the hell have I got stuck? I had a cardiac surgeon who would throw a fit if you know what he required for the surgery was not there in a given period of time. And there was this non-medical you know, graduate in economics trying to figure out what has to happen and how to get those goods and what to do and so on and so forth. And uh, from there, you know, took me to being a general manager, commercial, director, administration. Uh, then finally, so, you know, 5%. So 77% of it does lie in what is the healthcare delivery space. Now, there are lots of challenges, you know, as far as healthcare is concerned. And again, Colonel Kapoor referred to some of them, which is the media and what's happening. But I'll come to some of that. But very quickly, uh, you know, one of the first things is that the healthcare spend in India at 4.5% of the GDP is very, very low for a country of our size. Now, public spend is again very very limited in our country in India it is only 1.4 percent in Brazil it is 3.8 percent and I've taken countries like China US Cuba you know where it goes up to 10 percent in India the public spend is 1.4 percent now 20 only 27 percent of Indians are covered under insurance so you know statistically I think 29 percent of the healthcare in India is provided by the government sector and 71 percent is provided by the private sector and 62% of the spend is out of pocket. So which means that if 100 rupees is spent on healthcare in India, 62 rupees is a burden on the individual himself or herself to pay that money. And that, if you look at it, is probably the crux of the matter in a lot of ways because everywhere else there are insurances that end up paying. Here you have to end up paying for your uh, healthcare. So, uh, out-of-pocket expenditure, I just said, was 62%. Now, this out-of-pocket expenditure, you look at in countries like the USA and UK is less than 20%. In Brazil, it is 25%. Even a country like Pakistan has got less than us at 56%. So 62% is one of the highest out-of-pocket spends that you have in uh, healthcare. There's a shortage of beds, doctors, nurses, you name it. 
45% of the population has to travel more than 100 kilometers to get to medical care in some form or the other. And now, you know, in spite of all of this, you know, uh, I would like to think that healthcare is still an exciting space to be in. And I assume that a lot of you are, you know, aspiring to get into healthcare. And one of the reasons is that you do think that, yes, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's something to look forward to as far as healthcare is concerned. Now, coming to, you know, the fact uh, that, you know, some of the challenges, and again, uh, it's got to do with Google, and it's got to do with the fact that people today are actually studying about their disease even before they come there, and half the patients are telling the doctors what they should be prescribed, and, and how they should be going, and why this line of treatment is not being followed as opposed to uh, another line of treatment. And you all know that there is a huge trust deficit as things stand. So that's a very, very major uh, challenge as far as uh, healthcare is concerned. So there is this one, he says, you know, he's a very good doctor and I trust him. But I must confess that I always double check his diagnosis in Google before I start, you know, having whatever he tells me to have. And here's this one, it says, I've looked up my symptoms and this is a patient telling a doc and I have either got swine fever or this or that and whatever, whatever. And, you know, he's told him these are the five options and now I'm banking on you to tell me what you think is my problem. So that's one challenge that we have as far as working in healthcare is concerned. Patients' relatives. You know, people say that, you know, honestly, treating a patient who's probably not conscious for most of his stay in the hospital is less challenging than treating or looking after the attendants. And I think, you know, we, while we are wondering what are the courses that uh, you know, different universities should have. I think this is one attendant handling could actually be a good subject or at least part of a course to see what do we need to do. Now you look at, you know, a Western country or wherever, you know, you're allowed an attendant or two to meet a patient. There are fixed hours. Nobody bothers to hang around there during the daytime. If it's five to six, a person will work for the day, come at five o'clock, go and meet his mother or sister or whatever it is, spend some time there and come away. In our case, they are there in the hospital. It is part of solidarity. Uh, there's almost an invisible register there where a tick mark is put as to who's come there and who's not come there. And people make it a point to tell you so-and-so came and so-and-so came and so-and-so came. So all of that is a huge challenge, you know, uh, as far as healthcare is concerned. Regulatory bodies, you know, uh, policy makers, the media, uh, which are uh, referred to, politicians, uh, now, all of this, I think nothing competes with this one point, which is that it is considered sinful to make money from healthcare. And yet, it's ironical that there are shareholders, like shareholders in any other company, who buy shares into healthcare and expect a return from that money. And this is the biggest dichotomy in private healthcare as to what you know, for even, for example, the margin that you make. You know, what is an acceptable margin and where does it get to that border where it becomes sinful? Most large companies are listed companies. You check the, uh, the, uh, the results uh, of any of these uh, companies. I think 14 to 15% EBITDA is probably considered one of the best uh, outcomes that healthcare can give you. And the reasons for this are that it calls for very, very heavy investments. Technology changes faster than you can imagine. You've got a particular equipment. In two years or three years, that equipment is almost obsolete because something that has come out which is safer for a patient, which is less time consuming for a patient, the results of which are more reliable than the equipment that you've got. And therefore, what you have tends to become uh, irrelevant in some ways. I, I spoke about, you know, let's say the Medical Council of India, the government. Then, you know, there is this whole question of perception. And very young I was when I learned, you know, that perception is reality. So, you know, here, whether there are four sticks or three sticks, it says, when truth is blurred by lies and misinformation, perception becomes reality and all is lost. So today, for example, I mean, you've all read about how private healthcare has been singled out all that is being said and because the emotional quotient in something like healthcare is so high you know everything boils down to life and death 
you know, not that I went to a restaurant and I had a meal and the quality of the meal was not very good. It's the patient walked in and I'm taking a body out. Now, it's such a huge statement that anything that you did in between really has very little meaning. So that's, uh, you know, I would say uh, another very, very daunting task as far as healthcare is concerned. Clinician engagement. Now this, you know, it says that 54% of the physicians in US report a loss of enthusiasm for work, feelings of cynicism and a low sense of personal accomplishment. I don't know whether you've, you know, off late, uh, at least in Chandigarh where I live, there have been studies that have been uh, done and they found that doctors and especially young doctors are suffering from depression and are hugely depressed. And I know Dr. Rajiv spoke about uh, emotional aspects that you are going to have in the universities. Uh, in, in large medical institutes, they are now looking at how do we counsel doctors and what do we do. And this has got to do with long hours of work stress at work, tackling attendance, violence against doctors that is on the increase. All of this is putting a lot of pressure as far as uh, doctors are concerned. And you know, there's a, a very nice, a very senior uh, a clinician by the name of Dr. Ashok Seth. Uh, he's a cardiologist in R.S. Scott's Hospital in Delhi. And I worked very closely with him for many years. And you know, he once gave a talk in terms of, you know, this, uh, the bridge, how to bridge the gap between hospital administrators and clinicians. And he spoke about the fact that, you know, often, you know, you have a workforce, you pep up your workforce in order to achieve an objective, and they follow you blindly. But when it comes to healthcare, it's extremely difficult because many of those whom you expect or are important in your endeavor to do better and do more, have a thought process which does not align purely into wanting to make money. And there is this thought in your mind which says that I have been trained to do you know, good, to do, you know, treat the poor and so on and so forth. And that's something that even I face very often and I tell people that, you know, look here, I had the choice to either work for a trust hospital or to work in private healthcare. Private healthcare, like I said to you earlier, as investors, they expect a return. And when I come to this bit about you know, what has to be done for a CEO, often that balancing act is the challenge. And this slide is to tell you that not always will you find alignment in what you want to do when it comes to healthcare. So uh, you know, even this thing of challenges, continuous quality improvement, the fact that you know, things are changing, the pace at which they are changing you know, is extremely difficult for most healthcare companies to be able to keep up with. So now I come to you know, this bit about what does it take uh, to be a good successful CEO as far as healthcare is concerned. So first and foremost, in everything that you do, I think it is about leadership as the most important aspect. And this cuts across industry. And like I said, keeping this emotional quotient in mind, I singled out empathy as something that is very major as far as healthcare is concerned. And yet, while we have tests for uh, you know, intelligence, IQ, we can you know, test on various aspects, but empathy is something, at least I haven't come across uh, a good enough score or a good enough system whereby you actually interview people to understand as to whether they have empathy or they don't have empathy. You know, there was a time in our uh, organization, we have patient experience officers, their job is to go and meet with patients on a daily basis. And for some reason, you know, the thought behind it was that, you know, they must look pretty attractive in whatever format. And, you know, uh, there was that time when Kingfisher was, you know, at its peak, and they had these lovely uniforms, which was those maroon jackets and, you know, trousers that they wore. So in our company, there was a decision taken that all patient experience officers have to wear that uh, uniform. Now, I was the one who opposed it, and I turned on and said that it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not a beauty pageant where I want a lady who's going to fit into what looks like a Kingfisher air hostess's uniform. For a patient experience officer, empathy is what is the most important aspect that is required. And therefore, the way she dresses is not really necessary, uh, something that we need to conform to in terms of a Western dress. So I will come a little to this communication. You know, for every good leader, it's very important to be a storyteller. 
How do you motivate people at the end of the day is through communication. If I look at if any complaint that comes to us today in the healthcare sphere, 99% will boil down to poor communication, lack of communication, did not communicate adequately. If you can bridge that communication gap, everything is taken care of. And again, from a leader's point of view, it has a different perspective. But you know, while I'm still uh, you know, talking about the fact that communication is so important, you, know, you look at a VIP who comes to a hospital. You have a list, handle with care. The dock is the same. The bed is the same. The night suit is the same. The sheets are the same. The nurse is the same. The OT is the same. The sutures used are the same. Can anybody tell me what changes? Okay, attitude, communication. You over communicate. That is all that changes when you are giving special care to somebody. And therefore, communication is extremely important. And uh, I will narrate a you know, very quick story to you. I'm very mindful about the time. And I know that I haven't made too much progress as yet on the slides. A few years back, I was traveling back from Calcutta. And we were a large group which had gone there uh, for a meeting. And I mean, I was the chief operating officer. So people from my heads of hospitals from across the country had come uh, to Calcutta. And we were all together over there. And uh, I had to come back to Delhi. And I still remember I took a 7 o'clock jet flight or somewhere around 7 o'clock. A colleague of mine took a 6 o'clock Air India flight. And he was coming back on Air India. And uh, so the next morning we met. And we both had. So he just looked, met me and he said, sir, did you get caught uh, in that uh, crazy turbulence just before you hit Delhi? So I said, yeah, I did. And so I described what I went through. You know, we were about to land. It didn't look as if. There was a storm outside or, you know, whatever. And suddenly, you know, the aircraft started shaking around. My first thought was that, you know, by any chance, is this a new pilot? My second thought was that, you know, is it whiskey plus soda? And therefore, is he drunk? And uh, then my thought went to, you know, that as you settle down in the aircraft, they announce the name of the pilot. I said, yeah, what was his name? I have to find a contact in Jet Airways tomorrow and complain about the guy and so on and so forth. So anyway, very rough landing. I thought something had gone wrong. But anyways, and so, you know, while I was there, and, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I had a seat vacant next to me. The guy sitting on the win window abused, you know, the pilot. And I'm sure people had pulled out their beads and, you know, they were uh, sort of praying away. Anyway, we landed, bad landing. So I, I described this to him. So this colleague of mine tells me, he says, sir, I was on this Air India flight. And similar situation. And he says, sir, that... Uh, before we this thing, the pilot made an announcement. He just said, he said, this is unprecedented turbulence and you know, either there's a whatever building up, this, that. I'm going to make an attempt to land the aircraft here. And if I don't succeed, I will go to Jaipur and you know, whatever. Suddenly everyone started praying. Somebody had a child to go to tend to. Somebody had a mother to go and look after. And everybody prayed. So he tried to attempt a landing. He couldn't. He went back circled around, came back and landed the second time, maybe rough or whatever it is. He got a standing ovation. And this gentleman described him as a sick gentleman with about 30 years of flying experience. And when he came out of the cockpit, everyone clapped and said, thank you, sir. Now, if I think back, my pilot landed in the first shot. But the fact of the matter is he told us nothing about the degree of difficulty. Whereas this sick gentleman who was flying this Air India aircraft, told them that, look here, I'm going to attempt. I may not succeed. And the next thing is, I might take you to Jaipur. And nobody wanted to go to Jaipur. And therefore, everything that Jap did was OK because he got them home that evening. Clinical excellence. Now, you know, whichever way you look at it, and I, I, I will try and talk uh, a little about all of this as I go along, is the fact is that people are coming to you with trust. What they're looking for most is to be cured and go out of the hospital. So as a CEO, your job becomes very important in terms of patient safety, the kind of clinicians you have, the kind of equipment that you have, so that clinical excellence in a lot of ways becomes a given in your <coughs> outcomes. Patient centricity, it goes no introduction. You know, how, how do you work your systems around being patient centric, where people know that as a CEO, that this is something that is very dear to your heart. And therefore, there will be no compromise as far as patient centricity is concerned. As a head of the hospital, 
while most people would have you know had to probably knock on my door or maybe speak to somebody to say that they want to meet me my standard instruction was that the patient experience officer can walk into my office or a meeting that i am in irrespective of who i am meeting if she wants to come and tell me something pertaining to a patient so that is how you position it in terms of patient centricity now talent management you know again very very close to leadership but this whole concept of how do you look after the people who are you working with you how do you manage them and in talent management clinician engagement becomes an extremely important subset because at the end of the day if you can't get the clinician to align to the objective that you want to achieve that is you haven't even made a beginning as far as a hospital is concerned and finally is this concept of community connect i think with a lot that is happening in our country today the fact that you need to align with the local population and be able to connect with them and do things for them becomes very important so that you are acceptable in that area that you work out of so these to me are you know and while uh, again sir spoke about 55 traits of a leader and so on and so forth there is a whole lot that needs to be done but i would say that these are probably the important aspects of being a good leader as far as healthcare is concerned and last is investor confidence because whatever you do the people who have invested in you if they lose faith in what you are doing they withdraw what they put in and anything and everything that you stand for comes to or not so how do you take care of the person who's invested in your company and yet be able to do all of these things is where the challenge lies so this is a statement by this gentleman uh, carlos gosson i think he also worked in the automobile industry nissan as the ceo for many years and his statement was as a ceo i have to take care of the short term the mid term and the long term that's the challenge if you look at it very often if i have to take a decision and i say that you know this is what i need to do and i don't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen day after tomorrow the decision i take is going to be completely different from what i have to think of tomorrow and i have to think of day after tomorrow so therefore short term medium term long term all of this becomes extremely important these are certain competencies people were asked that what do you think are the top competencies that an individual should have so right now i listed off what i told you was important from being a ceo i am now talking about the leadership part of it so just to tell you that x number of people were polled and this was done by harvard if i remember it right sorry no this is uh, according to global and these are the qualities in order of importance that they spoke about for leadership so first and foremost was high ethical and moral standards that there is no compromise as far as integrity of the individual is concerned at number 2 was that provides goals and objectives with loose guidelines and directions i think the stress is on the word loose because at the end of the day nobody likes today to be over monitored they want a guideline and then they want to be left and hold them accountable for what is the result then they spoke about clearly communicates expectations has flexibility to change opinions is committed to my ongoing training communicates often and openly is open to new ideas creates a feeling of succeeding and failing together helps me grow into the next generation leader provides safety for trial and error i think all these in some ways sir has referred to and these are all what is uh, very very important for a leader to have now management is doing the right thing whereas leadership is about doing the right things and in this if my take is there is that you know very often you get tempted to take shortcuts where there can be a compromise on what you stand for or what the organization stands for while a manager might tend to do that at times but a leader cannot afford to do that ever I think have I got these mixed up yeah sorry i was here so now this is the next one where people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision while the vision is very very important you know what are we there for and so on and so forth but however compelling the the vision as long as you don't have comfort and belief in the leader you will never get there 
Now, again, coming back to the Indian Army, you know, the vision is so clearly articulated, the defense of my motherland. Nothing comes between that and the objective and what I need to do. And yet, there are different forms of leaders who can bring out different aspects of their troops with that same vision still there in their minds. So they first believe in the leader. And again, I've got three Fauji sitting here in front of me. While defense of the motherland is most important, but it starts with that local leader, comes to the regiment, comes to uh, you know, the religion, and finally comes down to the motherland. But they are fighting for the honor of that particular battalion more than anything else. And that battalion is identified with the leader that they are working under. So that is on uh, the leader. Now, I've got a slide here on Colin Powell. To me, Colin Powell was a four-star US general. He was the first black to become the chief of staff of, uh, in the US. And I think he became the national security advisor for the US as well. And he's got certain principles on leadership. I will just touch on one or two of them, but I will tell you that these are golden principles. If you can, you Google it and you will see that a lot of what you will do in life, if you have this in mind, you will find that you will not falter in any manner. So very you know, quickly, the one is that the day the soldier stops bringing you their problems is the day that you've stopped leading them. Just, you know, so the more people come to you with their problems, the more they believe that you are a person who can solve these problems. Keep looking below the surface appearance. Don't shrink from doing so just because you might not like to find out. You know, so people tend to say that you know, on the surface everything is alright, so everything is very good. They don't like to get into something which could be mucky, which could throw up things. They try and you know, very often finish their tenure with nothing coming out of that box in some ways. But as a good leader, you've got to get to you know, those issues as well. And then there is, you know, don't be afraid to challenge the pros even in their backyards. So if you have a belief, while they can be a subject matter expert, you must always talk about what you think is your belief in spite of whatever experience a person may come from. You know, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. You know, it says, you know, another principle of his is that as a leader, nobody should ever see your shoulders drooping. Because the day they see your shoulders drooping, they think that the cause is lost. So similarly, optimism is a force multiplier, which means that be optimistic in everything that you do. And you'll be surprised how people will tend to believe in you and uh, you know, propel you. So I know that I'm running a little short of time now. So I'm going to skip this. The, this is very, very important. What's your why? You know, I tell people that today a kid is putting his or her fingers into a plug point. You say, don't do it. That's not enough. When you tell the kid why not to do it and what will happen, if he or she continues to do that, they will understand what you have to say. So the why becomes very, very uh, important. And therefore, the why of what you do in an organization as a leader, why you are telling them to do it, is uh, extremely important. So in Fortis, a few years back, we coined this saving and enriching lives. And I thought that saving and enriching lives was all encompassing. You know, you could be a security guard in a hospital, and yet you played a role in saving and enriching lives. So the why. Now there is a video clip and okay, maybe that's a little later. So people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. It's the same subject. Uh, the, the, the difference between mere management and leadership is communication. So I'm coming on to the communication bit. So that means that the why ka ek video clip thai is maybe? So what is end me? Achha, you, it's separate, is it? Oh, yeah. separate. Okay, so ek, oh, while I'm still at the Y, so uh, if you could just play one of these. Ah, 
all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. Nah. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. OK, so very quickly, that was the why explained. And uh, if I can get back to the presentation. So with that, uh, you know, I've uh, finished this bit on leadership and now I come to uh, communication. The difference between mere management and leadership is communication. So a manager will tell you what to do and it probably ends there. As a leader, you have to continue to communicate. You have to keep guiding and the way you communicate and what you say is going to be extremely important. Uh, people may hear, hear you, your words, but they feel your attitude. So again, coming back to emotional quotient, attitude uh, is extremely important uh, you know, in all uh, leadership. And the most important thing is communication to hear what isn't being said. And what isn't being said often comes through body language and other aspects. And here is a slide which says that 55% of your communication is actually your body language. The words that you speak are only 38% in terms of communication. And the balance 7% is your tone and the you know, little emotion and the quiver and you know, whatever else you might be able to get into it, you know, that would help. But imagine as much as 55% lies in your body language, which is whether you put a hand on somebody's shoulder, you know, you know, every aspect of it is so visible of somebody who's good at being able to uh, communicate. So empathetic leader. You know, yeah, I know exactly how you feel. And I was taught very early uh, in healthcare, you know, empathy is being able to put yourself into the other person's shoes. And I thought that it needs no further explanation. It is empathy with the person you work with. It is empathy for somebody who has sold his household belongings to come and get his mother treated in your hospital. You know, all those aspects have got to do with empathy. And to me, this is what sets out a good hospital CEO from 
uh, a person, you know, you can't come into healthcare and say you care a damn and treat this <coughs> like any other industry. Empathy has to be at the core of what you do if you are in healthcare. Clinical excellence, I would just simply turn on and say that the most important thing, people are looking at outcomes, you have to remain focused in terms of uh, the fact that you have to be a leader, your outcomes have to be good, the clinicians you hire have to be good, the fact that your equipment has to be good, patient safety be has, has to be on foremost on your mind. Suddenly I'm speaking faster, I've got that 10 minute, warn 10 minute warning. Uh, okay, so putting patient first. So the next one is about patient centricity. How do you put the patient first, you know, in terms of whatever we do? Uh, I'll skip this uh, because I do want to leave a few minutes for question and answers and that's why, you know, I'm trying to pick up the speed. So, you know, here, you know, we just spoke about Apple. Now, this is, you've got to start with the customer experience and work backward towards technology, not the other way around. So again, in healthcare, it has to start with the convenience of the patient. You can't make a rule that completely disregards, you know, what the patient might want. Very often, you have to take that first and work backwards. So again, I'm now talking about patient centricity and the importance of patient centricity in being a leader as far as healthcare is concerned. Now, talent management, you know, this is a very, very, I, I love this topic because I think at the end of the day, your success and failure depends upon how well you can manage people. And this slide is a simple tug of war. But in this, there are, you know, either the team has won or the team has lost there are no individual winners. And that's what a good team is all about. Synchronized, all cylinders firing, and therefore success is what has come by virtue of the might of that team. Very often things go wrong where, you know, people are isolated, people are made to feel that, you know, they are bigger than the institution, that they are the ones who are, you know, creating what they are. So this teamwork is very, very important and a lot has been said about it. Uh, you know, Vinit Nair wrote the book, I think, which was Employee First, you know, which is simply to say that if you take care of your employee, you can be rest assured that your customer or your patient is completely taken care of. Care of. So uh, this is, uh, you know, again, uh, this is to say that, you know, my job is to make decision, decisions. Your job is to make them good decisions. What this says is that, you know, no longer can you bully people. You have to carry people, you know, in terms of what you do. I'm going to skip one of this, but this is my favorite, J.R.D. Tata. And I'm going to read this out. Please listen to this carefully. It says, if I have merit in getting along with individuals according to their ways and characteristics, at times it involves suppressing yourself. It is painful but necessary to be a leader you have to lead human beings with affection. Colonel Kapoor has gone at the wrong time, but affection, again, empathy and emotional quotient. And I often tell people that, you know, for a man to cry, there's nothing wrong. A lot of men think it's not macho enough if you break down or you cry on, you know, something that touches you in some ways. But this bit about leading with affection is extremely uh, important and more so in the case of healthcare, you've got so many uh, you know, young nurses working with you, impressionable age, 18 to 19 years of age, they've left their homes, they've come and they're working in a hospital surroundings, they're getting abused by clinicians at times, there are, you know, attendants who are firing them up, you know, in all this kind of an atmosphere, this part of affection becomes extremely uh, necessary. Now, this is Starbucks, again, coming back to, uh, you know, he says that we built Starbucks brand first with our people, not with the consumer. If your employee believes that you are solid, you can be rest assured that the people coming to you will feel that you are solid. So here, uh, Starbucks talks about the fact that their employees believed in them and that's how they became a success. Uh, Richard Branson, the person who started Virgin Atlantic and he's got huge industries in the UK, is again a great, great ambassador of talking about people, encouraging people, empowering people, you know, this, I, the other day I saw an interview where he spoke about flexi timing. He said, I don't want to know what time you came and what time you went. I trust you. This is the job. As long as the job is done, it's perfectly all right. So he is taking this whole concept to a completely different you know, level altogether. I won't get into this. 
Now, finally, clinician engagement. And you know, here I say that this relationship between the clinician who is going to lead what you want to do in healthcare and administrators who have a task that is cut out, you know, how do the two of them uh, work together becomes extremely important. And I spoke about Dr. Ashok said, so here I was, uh, you know, landed up in escorts to head escorts. Dr. Ashok said, had started his career in escorts, moved on to Max Hospital, Delhi, came back to escorts the year that I was there. So when he came back, I was already positioned as the head of the hospital. And there was this larger than life uh, cardiologist coming back to escorts. And the whole question was, you know, how do the two balance out? And I thought we did an amazing, amazing job. I think I could, you know, write a case study on, you know, that relationship between him and me. But he told me the day he joined, he says, you know, Ashish, first thing, let's meet every Wednesday for two to three hours. I thought it was an overkill. It was the best thing that ever, ever happened in my working in relationship with clinicians. Second was, if you hear anybody say that I have said something, so before he could finish, I said, I'll pick up the phone and talk to you. He said, don't pick up the phone, come to me. And the same applies as far as if I hear that you've done something or said something. That trust and that bond that we built. Escorts used to do a turnover of 20 crores at a point in time. It came down to 10 crores when I went there. And we took it back to 20 and way beyond. But, you know, I gave a presentation one year which was 20, 10, 20 not another form of cricket. And that was about the you know, coming back of uh, escorts. And this relationship with Dr. Ashok said, and what I spoke about, you know, that whole clinician engagement bit of it was extremely crucial uh, in that. And finally, investor confidence. I just want you to know that you cannot get so emotionally involved in what you're doing in healthcare that you care a damn as far as where the buck came from. Because at the end of the day, that return to investor is what it is all about. Otherwise, there is no difference between you know, what you are trying to do. Then you have to say that, yeah, I am a philanthropist. I will have you know, this kind of equipment. I will not charge. It's a very different ball game altogether. So Community Connect, again, G, I keep saying this. It's a very, very important thing. In Fortis Healthcare, we believe it in, in it very strongly. The year 2015, uh, there was that earthquake in Nepal. I you know, had been the chief operating officer, five minutes, thank you, G. Uh, uh, I was the chief operating officer and I led a team of about 25, I think there were seven, eight clinicians and 10, 12 nurses and whatever. And we went down to Nepal and we were there for 15 days. We went to the most difficult terrain, uh, you know, assisted people over there, worked with them. You know, a cause like that uh, is something that, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, it's something that is, uh, gives back, uh, uh, gives you a lot and you help give back society in some ways and as a CEO you must uh, you know believe in that and lead that you know by example and I'm going to at the risk of whatever can you just show that last clip G? Yes. and in the meanwhile if you could just think about uh, questions that you might have and the only thing Ashish is that there was a little overrun on my time do you think I have a little time by <laughs> virtue of the fact that uh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> so we'll just see this quick clip there's only tea after this just quick clip and I'm just saying if there are questions, if there are none, then I'm well within time. <coughs> this is to do with the cause.
Okay, Ji. So, <coughs> questions if there are any, otherwise I am well within time. Yes. Are you from Anandpur? Not from Anandpur, but I know the okay. situation. Okay, good. So you are from West Bengal for sure. Yes. So, ji, I'll just tell you. You know, healthcare has become the new whipping boy. It's the vote earner, and the governments want to promise, you know, free healthcare and so on and so forth. Today, you can just pick up a complaint and go anywhere. So, West Bengal has come up with what is called the Clinical Establishment Act. The Clinical Establishment Act has put together some ex-judges and some other people and created a committee. Anybody who has a complaint can go to that committee. And doctors are brought to that committee. Very often that committee, you know, doesn't understand, you know, medical terms, courses of treatment, what was done, why it was done. And therefore, the lady is absolutely right. It is humiliating for doctors who have put in a lifetime into education and treating patients to go there and try and explain to somebody what was the line of treatment that he took. You know, they say hindsight is a wonderful sight. When you are trying to treat a patient, given the set of circumstances, you do certain things. Outcomes are never the same for two patients. My mother had a bypass surgery in Apollo many years back and she did well and I thought it was a wonderful hospital. My Masi died in Apollo. My first cousins cursed that hospital. So the fact is that these are challenging circumstances. I keep saying you go to a restaurant, you know, there's a particle in your soup. You make a bit of a noise, he comes, he says, sir, next meal, this meal is on the house and two more meals on the house. And you say, wow, and you walk out. You don't do that in healthcare. Very little can compensate you for what you've lost. So the point is that yes, this Clinical Establishment Act, while intent may be good, I don't think execution is right and it's very difficult to be able to judge you know, in terms of medical neglig negligence if you are only going by outcome as to decide as to whether there was medical negligence or not. Bhikkuji, so all of this is driving uh, private healthcare into a corner. Uh, it's going to make it unviable at a point in time. And therefore, I keep saying that this is not the right thing to do. In the year, you know, uh, let's look at a simple thing, stent pricing. <coughs> in the year 2012, November, I had an angioplasty. I was wheeled into a cath lab. The stent used on me was the best stent available in the world. And if there was a patient being wheeled into a cath lab in New York, chances are that he and I got the same stent. Today with this cap on stents, no new technology is coming into our country. The stent that is available at 30,000 will always continue to be available at 30,000. The advancements, the research the world is making won't come to our country. It's ironical. All they had to do was say three stents at 30,000 so the common man is not denied treatment. You know, I give people the example, it's like saying all SUVs in India will be sold at 15 lakh rupees. It can't happen. Which, is, which hospital are you from? Okay. Gee, you are so right. You know, somebody has, else's house is burning. And you say that his house is burning, not knowing that yours could be next. And therefore, unity in healthcare is something very, very important. And I think we are moving towards it, but a lot more needs to be done. Yeah. Hello. Sir, actually, I am working in a medical college hospitals. And as an administrator, sir, actually, we have one problem. I want to, uh, just one suggestion from you and if you are the CEO uh, for that hospital, what you will do? Sir, actually now government is what they are doing, they are giving uh, packages like a smart card and Bhamasa like that. 
so in that uh, uh, there are uh, one package for one surgery and one uh, procedures and in that if we are going properly treatment under proper treatment then that cost is not uh, sufficient for the hospitals so for that what we have to do what's your name uh, sk singh sk singh so bhama sha uh. firstly is a very successful scheme in rajasthan you know in terms of the number of people that it's covered so you know the way i look so at it is that if you've taken the scheme you have no option but to adhere to the rules of the game if you could have stayed away from it fantastic so as a private healthcare player we've chosen to stay away from it it gives you huge volumes and in bama sha all else says don't look at loss in a procedure try and look at the overall picture so you could lose to win some overall if you do a little better than where you were that's probably the answer Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. sir okay, sorry ji. for interruption. Can we continue the session after connections? Yeah, yeah. Perfectly all right. Thank you. Thank you. In spite of being from a non-medical background, sir has an extreme, extensively rich experience of the healthcare industry, and we are fortunate that we got to hear from sir today. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Rajiv sir to felicitate our esteemed guest. Let's break let's break for a cup of refreshing tea which is being served just outside the auditorium. Kindly be seated for the next session by 3:25 pm sharp. Thank you.